was your... You get next to me. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, everybody, and welcome. My name is Trey Grayson. I'm the director of the Institute of Politics here at the Kennedy School. I want to welcome everybody to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum for tonight's forum, all about health care and why it matters uh, in the presidential race and beyond. Uh, tonight's forum is co-sponsored by the Malcolm Wiener Center for Social Policy, as well as the HKS Health Policy PIC. Any of the, the PIC members here? I want to thank you guys in particular for all your hard work in promoting and pubbing, as the students say, pubbing this event. Uh, we appreciate it. Uh, tonight's event is going to be moderated by Sheila Burke, uh, who is an adjunct professor here at the Kennedy School. Uh, she's the former executive dean and was the chief of staff to Senator Bob Dole for many years on the Hill. And we're really excited to have her, not just at the school, but also as moderator for tonight. So please join me in welcoming Sheila Burke. Thank you very much. Um, we are pleased to be here, and we are particularly pleased to be here this week. Uh, it is a terrific opportunity to talk about an issue that is near and dear to all of our hearts and appears to be, uh, for a change, uh, at the top of the discussion in terms of the elections that are forthcoming. Uh, the Wall Street Journal has um, framed the current health care debate uh, as a choice between government control and individual choice. Uh, the candidates have taken their position that they are either securing the future of health care, which is what President Obama has said, or replacing Obamacare with real health care reform, which is what Governor Romney has said. Both argue that health care is uh, one of our greatest strengths as a nation, but is also one of our greatest challenges in terms of trying to come to grips with what it is that we need to do going forward. Uh, health policy has, in general, been more of an issue in this year's race uh, than has generally been the case. Uh, but the focus has been almost overwhelmingly on two very specific topics. Uh, one, the health care overhaul that was passed in 2010, and secondly, the future of Medicare. Uh, tonight, we have an opportunity to hear from two individuals uh, who can perhaps tell us what the plans and the priorities are of both candidates going into 2013. Uh, will the budget negotiations overwhelm absolutely everything else in terms of discussion. Uh, is President Obama prepared to put Medicare on the table uh, during the course of those discussions? How we will sustain the program? Uh, what elements of the ACA will Governor Romney live with? Uh, and are ERs really the answer to the uninsured? Uh, where will health care fall in terms of the must-dos and what are the obstacles that we would imagine having to face in the coming uh, months and years? Uh, but first of all, we will hear from our colleague, Bob Blendon, uh, who better than anyone else I know can tell us what the American people really think uh, and what they expect from their candidates. Uh, I'm going to e introduce each of our speakers uh, at the beginning. Uh, we have asked each of them to give more than, no more than 10 minutes. We will hold them, and I'm looking at Tom Scully. We will hold them to that, uh, to that timeline. Tom and I have known each other for a very long time. I'm watching him. So we will hold them to 10 minutes each. We will then open it up for discussion and for your comments. Uh, professor Robert Blendon is the Richard Menchel Professor and Senior Associate Dean for Policy Translation and Leadership Development at the Harvard School of Public Health. He holds appointments as a professor of health policy in both the School of Public Health as well as here at the Kennedy School and has been uh, a beloved and frequent uh, lecturer for a number of us for many years. Uh, he directs the Harvard Opinion Research Program, which focuses on better understanding the public's knowledge and attitudes and beliefs about major <coughs> social welfare policies in the U.S. and other nations, and currently co-directs the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Harvard School of Public Health Project on Understanding Americans' Health Agenda. Vivek Murthy, uh, is an attending physician uh, at the Brigham and Women's Hospital and an instructor at Harvard Medical School where he is an internal medicine hospitalist. He is co-founder and president of Doctors for America, which is a grassroots organization of over 15,000 physicians and medical students in 50 states. Uh, they are working to help provide a health care system that is fair and equitable uh, and affordable for all Americans. 
2011, he was appointed by President Obama to the National Advisory Group on Prevention, Health Promotion, and Integrative and Public Health. Tom Scully uh, is a partner at Alston Bird, which is a law firm in Washington, D.C., uh, and focuses his practice on healthcare regulatory and legislative matters. Uh, he is also a general partner with Welsh Carson, which is a um, private equity firm in uh, New York, headquartered out of New York City, and actually does a tremendous amount of work in the field. Uh, Tom was the administrator of CMS, uh, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, from 2001 to 2004, and before joining CMS was the president and CEO of the Federation of American Hospitals, uh, and has been very actively engaged in a variety of healthcare issues for many years. Uh, of note, I should also note, since he would appear to be the only non-Harvard person on the stage, he actually serves on the executive council of the Harvard School of Public Health. So he is one of the motherhood as well. So with that, I will turn it to Bob. Uh, hi, Bob Lennon. Don't tell anybody, but I'm secretly a teacher. So <laughs> what I want to do is explain this issue in the election, where it stands, what it means to voters, as distinct from members of the policy community, and how it's playing out. And I'm going to do something which I recommend to everybody in politics never do, show PowerPoint. Uh, so we'll do this very quickly. Uh, and the uh, uh, first thing is, uh, basically, health care ranks number two this year. Uh, and it has never been as high since 1992. And uh, what I show you here is very important, a quick lesson. Uh, what you read in the newspapers, they talk about how things are very important, and 8 out of 10 think health care is very important. 8 out of 10 think about 7 things are very important. Uh, in an election, what really counts is it's the top issue in your vote. And essentially this year, basically 1 in 7 voters say, this is my top issue. Why it's important this year is if the economy uh, was won by one candidate, you wouldn't have to worry about our issue. The problem is for a candidate, they're not going to win it. They're going to split it. So each candidate has to find other voters who care about something else. That's why health care is going to be so important in, in the last uh, 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 few weeks of this. The uh, health care issue, uh, it turns out not to be a single issue. It is in the Affordable Care Act, uh, the way people would describe it, uh, Medicare, and as I showed you, uh, Medicaid and for a share of voters, abortion is our actually top issue. That always shocks people in some worlds, but there's a share of people who just feel they must vote uh, uh, on the candidates uh, stand on that issue. And I want to take you just in the two biggest, which is the Affordable Care Act and, and Medicare, to show how it's played. And uh, so, uh, those of you who are obsessed with polls know there's a huge fight over uh, why the polls are different in the presidential races. Turns out we've had the same problem in health care. So what you see on the slide is I averaged out 27 polls done by seven organizations. Simply, since the bill was passed, uh, basically the majority of Americans never favored this bill. They never opposed it. Uh, the weekly stories up, down, green people, purple, uh, actually once you average it out, they never existed. Basically, it's been pretty flat uh, all the way down the line. Since the Supreme Court, there's been a slight narrowing. So you have this huge issue uh, that's very important to people. And what I'm going to get into in a second is uh, it turns out that people just don't differ on policy, how we pay doctors or hospitals. They actually have big value differences. And we'll look at it in a second. So let me summarize basically all kinds of polls. Uh, how can I be against this thing? One student said, how can they be against it? Okay, how can I be for it? Another student said to me. All right, put very simply, people believe the bill is good for the poor, the uninsured, and people who get sick. They don't convince that it's good for people who have health insurance, taxpayers, or businesses. Uh, and I just said to you, the economy is the top issue. They must think this is really good for the economy. Turns out more people think it's not good for the economy than do. So that's the summary of where this issue is playing out uh, uh, pretty much uh, across the, the country. I want to secretly show you what polarization means. I'm bored and newspapers are polarized. I, you know, students say to me, I don't know if it's polarized. Uh, this is what polarization looks like. All you have to look at is something that says that 80% of Democrats love this bill and 80% of Republicans hate it. That's called technically polarization <laughs> uh, uh, for that. 
So that's what it is, and that's why the election is so important, because I would assume that people who hate it would get it if they won, and people who like it are going to be implementing it uh, uh, for that. So here are a few uh, uh, values. Many of you may have caught the intro uh, to the nomination of Governor Romney, where Governor Christie of New Jersey said, we have the best health care system, and we're going to hold on to it. You know what? The majority of Republicans agree with them. You know what? The majority of Democrats at the other convention would have booed them. Uh, they don't agree with them. So this starts out. Let's deal a simple thing. Should the government cover everybody with insurance? Uh, basically, 71% of Democrats say yes, and 20% of Republicans going this the election say yes. Uh, in my business, that's called value differences. Uh, for that, uh, and uh, here is, is government mucking around too much in health care, or is the rollabout right? And the top is, for Democrats, it's right. Uh, for uh, Republicans, it is too way involved in this bill. So this is where this issue I is uh, playing out. And, and one quickie is because we always meet in one spot. So there are two lovely sunspots in America, California and Florida. Just last week, the majority of people who live in California were voters said, I like this bill. The week before, the majority of people who live in Florida said, I don't like this bill. So uh, this is how it's playing out. It's not the same in, in, in every state. Let me switch to Medicare, uh, which is the uh, second issue. So before we get to Congressman Ryan, it's important to understand before he was nominated, asking people, uh, in order to solve the problems of Medicare, do you want a major, let me go back, a major change? One half of America said no. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, and it turns out if you ask those who want major changes, a lot of them don't like the major changes when they hear it. Uh, so we start this election. Congressman Ryan comes along, introduces a bill, which whatever you want to say is called major change uh, for that. And it's dramatically changing uh, uh, where it is. So this is a summary of four polls. I don't think you need a calculator to see how this issue is playing. Uh, basically, I chose no poll that used the word voucher or didn't mention it didn't affect the next generation. So the four polls don't use voucher, talk about the next generation, and what you have to understand is the people who most dislike this are over the age of 50, uh, the highest voting population. So uh, this is the second issue that is uh, playing. Let me put on Governor Romney's hat uh, for a second and explain uh, what he's campaigning on. So uh, what he's basically saying is, on the Affordable Care Act, stop talking about Ryan. Let's talk about the Affordable Care Act. They took money out of that plan that's going to make it worse for people who retire. Uh, we don't know where it's going to be in the debate, but right before the debate at the moment, about half of people still believe that over 65 people will be better off. But there's a close to 4 in 10 that don't. That is what the other side of the campaign is focusing on. The $700 billion disappeared. If you retired, you're going to be worse off. So uh, this pretty much summarizes where we are, but I'm going to give you one fact. I told you that one in seven uh, are really voting on this issue. And the other fact is they're almost all over age 50. So when you watch the polls, when you watch the debate, when you watch the discussions, you have to understand that this real battle in my world for voters is heavily aimed at people over age 50. That is really what the next few weeks are going to be about in terms of this issue and the election. Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you, Bob. That was, uh, I always find it very interesting to see polls that Bob has put together. Um, I was asked to speak a little bit about, the, uh, about the President Obama's uh, campaign around health care. And what I'll focus on is what he sees as his signature achievement, which is the Affordable Care Act. And let me start with a, with a, a simple um, introduction, which is personal, about why somebody like me who doesn't really, didn't really care about politics or policy for most of his life has come to actually support this law and wants uh, the law to move forward. So I actually grew up uh, pretty far away from here in Miami. Uh, my father is a physician, and I spent a lot of time as a kid in his office uh, seeing patients come and go uh, and watching what he did uh, as a doctor. And during those times, I came to see medicine in one of its best moments, which was an opportunity for a patient to come in not feeling so well uh, and then to leave feeling better. Uh, I came to also see somebody like my father, who came from very humble roots in a small village in India, have the opportunity to really put his head 
and his heart together in building a mutually therapeutic relationship with patients. And that set the standard for me of what medicine could be like in its best moments. And it was that that inspired me to go into medicine myself. But when I got to medicine, I encountered what so many doctors and patients have encountered, which is that the system, in many ways, uh, has a huge gap between the reality of what patients and doctors face and the ideals that brought so many of us to medicine. When I got to medicine, what I found was that there were physicians all around me who came wanting to take care of patients and instead found themselves knowing exactly what a patient needed but unable to actually ensure that patient could get the treatment they need because they often didn't have insurance. I saw patients uh, struggle to get insurance but often fail because the insurance was too expensive uh, or because they were denied coverage because of a pre-existing condition. And all around me I saw a system that was, that was broken in so many ways. It was fragmented. There was a lot of waste in the system. Um, and there was also an inversion of incentives. Uh, there was a system that fundamentally rewarded uh, physicians like me for how much we did, how many procedures we did, how many tests we did, but not actually for how well we took care of you or your mother or your father, uh, if they were our patients. So this is what, uh, what I encountered. And the reason that I and so many other physicians around the country and why the largest medical organizations in the country came together in 2010 to support the Affordable Care Act, because we saw it as the first major step that we've taken in a generation to actually address these challenges and to move us forward. We supported it not because we thought it was a perfect solution, but because we thought it did more to move us forward than anything had in many, many years. So there are four key things uh, that I would point out to you uh, that physicians and that many uh, patient advocates have focused on in terms of why they support uh, this law. The first has to do with its expansion of insurance coverage. I think almost all of us, I think all of us would agree on this stage. Uh, that the fact that people don't have insurance coverage is a problem, uh, and that's something that needs to be fixed. And the Affordable Care Act actually extends coverage, or will extend coverage when it's in full effect, to 30 million plus people. Uh, a huge, huge step forward. So that's the first thing. And as we know, when people don't have access to health care, it's hard for them to get care, period. It's hard for them to get preventive care. It's hard to actually address illness early before it becomes complicated, hard for patients to endure, and expensive for the system to take care of. The second big reason that, uh, that many supported the health care law had to do with certain regulations that were placed on insurance companies. And these are regulations that ensured that certain longstanding discriminations which had been taking place, discriminations against people who had pre-existing conditions, uh, against folks who got too sick and hence were dropped for coverage, uh, there were portions put into the law which ensured that those would now be banned. Uh, and why is this so important? It's important because if you happen by you know, ill fortune to get hit by a car, uh, as one of my good friends did uh, when she was young, uh, and you then have a pre-existing condition, uh, you, it becomes very hard for you to get insurance if you're an individual on the market. Uh, at least it was uh, prior to the Affordable Care Act being passed. Um, we also, you know, shortly after the Affordable Care Act was passed, I remember distinctly getting an email from a physician in Alabama. Her name is Ann Drum. And Ann is a primary care doctor in one of the poorest parts of Alabama, uh, on the coast. And Ann, in addition to being a doctor who takes care of the poor, is also a patient herself. She has common variable immune deficiency and requires monthly infusions of something called IVIG or intravenous immunoglobulin. And she needs this to survive to boost her immune system, but she also needs it so that she can be with patients who are sick as well and not get sick herself. Now, the thing that concerned Anne was that she was actually running up uh, close to her lifetime cap and coverage and was worried that she was going to lose not only her own health care and life-saving treatment, but the ability to take care of patients as well. And after the health care law passed, she wrote us an email that said, thanks to this law being passed, I can finally breathe a sigh of relief that I may not need to give up practicing medicine and risk my own health. The third and fourth things I'll lump together into, into one category, which are essentially changes uh, in our delivery system and how we actually get health care uh, to patients. And as anyone who has encountered a hospital, who has been in a clinic, uh, knows that our health care system is not delivering care in a way that's ideal. Uh, we're not incentivizing the right things, um, and our system is way too fragmented. But what this law does, which helps us move forward on those accounts, is one, it actually strengthens primary care. Uh, as a result of this law, primary care physicians and general surgeons will get more in the way of reimbursement, more in the way of loan forgiveness. And what I can see, actually, in my own work with residents you know, every day, is I can see that in the last few years, thanks to the reform law and thanks to a number of innovation programs on the delivery side, we are seeing the interest of medical students in primary care and of residents as well 
surge. And that is a positive thing, I say, as somebody who trained in a primary care program. But there's also a big focus on prevention. Um, you know, all of us, you know, can probably agree that it's better to prevent illness than to end up trying to treat it later down the line. Uh, and what the law does is it actually invests heavily uh, in prevention. Uh, as a result of the law, last year over 80 million seniors, uh, not just seniors, but folks who have <coughs> private insurance, non-Medicare as well, uh, receive, were eligible for free preventive services. I mean, serv preventive services without copays. These are mammograms. These are colonoscopies. These are immunizations and the like. And finally, on the delivery system side, there have been a host of demonstration projects, very important pilot programs, which are experimenting with new ways of actually delivering care. In the beginning, I mentioned that one of the things that struck me so clearly when I entered medicine was the fact that we were incenting uh, physicians and hospitals to do more, but not necessarily do better uh, for patients. And in these new uh, uh, systems, you know, pilot projects, uh, in both in accountable care organizations as well as in some of the global payment pilots, what we see is an attempt to now invert that incentive structure and to start rewarding physicians and hospital systems for the quality of care that they deliver. And that is ultimately, I think, a move in the right direction. These are some of the core things that the law does. And part of the reason that the law has, uh, you know, been so confusing is in part because the messaging hasn't been great around it, but in part because it actually does a lot. Uh, it does a lot of different things. And, um, and sometimes that can get a little bit confusing. But these are some of the core things that it does. Now, you can look at the numbers uh, about the Affordable Care Act. You can say, well, should I be impressed by the fact that 30 million plus people would be covered? Should I impre be impressed by the fact that millions more have already gotten access to health insurance? And yes, a lot of imp impressive numbers, I think, in what the law has already done. And this is even before it has been fully implemented. Uh, there are millions of seniors who are getting help with prescription drugs, which has been an ongoing problem for seniors for years. But what is actually most poignant about the Affordable Care Act is actually seeing the real stories of people on the ground. Uh, f last month, I actually had the, the privilege of being with a gr several dozen other doctors on a giant blue RV that was, went from the De Republican National Convention in Tampa all the way to the Democratic National Convention in Charlotte. It's part of our Patients Over Politics tour. And what we were doing uh, as physicians around the country who were Republicans, Democrats, and Independents is we were coming together to say to community members and to uh, our elected leaders that we see ways in which the Affordable Care Act is actually improving lives for our patients. We want that to move forward. We want to implement the law. We want to improve the law. Uh, but ultimately, we want to move forward with it. And we encountered thousands of people um, in Florida, South Carolina, Georgia, North Carolina along the way with extraordinary stories. I remember a young man at the University of South Florida who was 23 years old, was struggling to finish his degree because he was burdened with medical debt uh, because he was hospitalized last year for an unexpected illness. And he was still struggling without insurance. And when we told him that he could actually get insurance and stay on his parents' plan until the age of 26, you should have seen how, how excited he was and how relieved he was uh, to learn about that. We also encountered at a gas station an elderly woman, 79 years old, who is stacking cans, you know, despite having a bad back in the, in the store in the gas station. And we asked her a little bit about herself, and she said, you know, I actually retired a couple of years ago, uh, but the, the cost of medications was so high for me, uh, despite having Medicare, that I had to actually come back to work. And now that there's a, a move in the Affordable Care Act and a provision to actually close the donut hole, give seniors more money to actually care, take care of their medication expenses, people like her are starting to get more and more relief. And that, that is a good thing in the, in the end. And finally, I remember a, a nurse you know, in Tampa who I met, who had spent 19 years taking care of patients, then ran into her own health care problems, lost her insurance, and was struggling uh, to actually get care. And with the Medicaid expansion, uh, she will actually, too, be able to get care. So these stories tell the real, the real story about what's happening with the Affordable Care Act. It's why thousands of doctors uh, and thousands and millions of people around the country have supported the law and wanted to move forward. There's a lot that we can do together uh, across the aisle to actually make the law, um, to improve it, to make sure it's implemented in a way that uh, both doesn't hurt us financially but also helps patients. Um, and that's ultimately our challenge. But in this election, we're faced with a stark choice, and it's a choice of moving forward, implementing and improving a law, which is already helping millions of people, or moving backward. And as a physician who sees patients every day, who has seen the challenges of our healthcare system, uh, I would urge all of us to move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Tom? Man, I don't even know where to start. No. You're going to a direct contrast here between the nice, who could disagree with anything he said, the warm, fuzzy, Physician trying to do the right thing and the evil, rotten lawyer, Republican cheap guy. 
And I'm going to tell you all the reasons why he, I, I disagree with him. And generally, this clinical study has been shown that Democrats are nicer people. They're more fun to drink beer with. Unfortunately, <laughs> they're just wrong. Uh, but seriously, the, uh, you know, universe, who's not for universal coverage? The issue about this, and one thing you should mention, if I listen to the talk you gave, the, the continuing theme is more, more, more. All the stuff has to be paid for. That's the fundamental issue with the ACA. You know, the prob- problem you have, and I'll get into this, I designed, I think, maybe other people did, I probably have more to do with dying the Medicare drug benefit than anybody in the world, I believe. I spent three years of my life putting it together and pushing through Congress. So, uh, And I'll get into picking on your problems in the donut hole, which is the, closing the donut hole maybe the dumbest policy in the history of government, but I'll get into that later. Um, but, you know, when you look at it, the problem you have is the federal government is collecting $2.4 trillion this year in revenue, and you're spending 3.6. So you've got a 10% of GDP, 9% of GDP structural deficit. We're collecting basically two-thirds of what we spend, and we're, into, and we're creating the biggest entitlement program in the history of the world on top of that. Who, who is not for universal coverage? I'm for universal coverage. I'm not for universal coverage that's Cadillac coverage for way too many people. I mean, the problem you got here, if you go back and look at, I, Sheila had mentioned I was President Bush 41, the first Bush, I was his health care staffer in the White House. Sheila was Senator Knowles' staffer when we first dealt with each other. George Bush, we wrote a very extensive universal coverage plan back in 1992, didn't pass. Uh, it was very much looked like some of the structure of the Obama plan. It had about a third of the spending because that was the right thing to do. You don't need to oversubsidize everybody. I'll just go through some of the numbers. The ACA is a wonderful concept. We're adding 20 million people to the Medicaid rolls, up to 133% of poverty, starting in one year. January 1, 2014, we're adding 20 million people to the Medicaid rolls. There's already 42 million people on them, I believe. That is nuts when you've got a deficit, where you're collecting 65% of what you spend, you're going to add 20 million new people to the biggest entitlement expansion in the history of mankind next year in one shot. On top of that, you're adding 17 million new people to exchanges. Who's not for creating health care for, for everybody if you can afford it? But 17 million people, subsidies up to 400% of poverty. Does anybody know what 400% of poverty is in this room? $92,400 a family, I believe that is. 62% of Americans are going to get subsidized of the Obama health care plan. That is flat out nuts when you have a 9% of GDP deficit. It has nothing to do with doing the right thing. It has to do with fiscal insanity and fiscal irresponsibility. You don't go out when you're, when you're borrowing billions and billions and trillions of dollars a year from the Chinese and create giant entitlement expansions that you can't afford. So look, I'm 55, so I'm going to be paying for all this stuff. I'm probably, I probably should vote my own self-interest. <laughs> you guys are going to be paying for this for a hell of a long time. And you need to wake up and take a look at it. So nobody could be against the concept of what President Obama is trying to do it's just flat out crazy. You don't spend that kind of money when you're in that kind of deficit hole. You fix the system first. There are huge problems with Medicare, huge problems with Medicaid. I'll go through a few of them. Medicaid is a much bigger disaster than Medicare is. Medicaid's a mess. It's over $600 billion a year. It's 56 different state and territorial programs. None of them make any sense economically. They all scam the federal government. None of them is managed in any rational way. You're a wonderful Massachusetts miracle that Governor Romney and other people did. Fabulous program. Who's not going to like it? Does anybody know how much money Massachusetts put into that program? Anybody want to volunteer? How much Massachusetts money is in the Massachusetts waiver? Zero. None. It's 100% federal. It was all done through a Medicaid scam. So if you're the governor or you're a state legislator in Massachusetts, why not get universal coverage in Massachusetts with the other 49 states paying for it? That's the, front, that's the problem you got. Everybody wants somebody else to pay for this stuff. So I'm for universal coverage, but when you're dealing with the economics that we have, you should do it rash at a reasonable pace and see what works and fix what you got to begin with. You know, block grants, I, why am I a fan? I'm not necessarily a fan of block grants. I'm a fan of giving the states a rational structure. In every state you want to go through as you're all getting masters or PhDs in government, go take a look at the Medicaid program and find me one state that works under its match, one state that doesn't do disproportionate share taxes, if you figure out what that is, or upper, upper payment limits or intergovernmental transfers. The biggest scam in the history of government is that the states don't pay for anything in Medicaid. Your next door neighbor state, I'm on the board of the Dartmouth Medical School. How much money do you think the state of Massachusetts puts into its Medicaid program? Zero, not one dollar. It's 100% federal. Does anybody understand that? No. You're all government students. You ought to be looking at this stuff. It's your money. So when you get into this stuff, okay, I, I happen to think we should not, may not block grant Medicare, but we should at least get back to some kind of per capita payment where the states, including Massachusetts, have some rational incentive to run this thing in a rational way. Medicaid's a mess. Medicare, the Medicare prescription drug program, I'm very proud of it. I spent a lot of time cooking it up. 14 million people in Medicare, poor people, have no deductibles and no copayments. If you're poor, you have no deductibles and no copayments, period. The donut hole was, was created for a reason. I was involved in creating it. 
Rich people don't need a full Medicare subsidy. They need the catastrophic drug benefit. And what happened? We put the donut hole in. On January 1st, seniors who weren't poor looked at it and said, oh, my God, I better start not taking Lipitor. I better switch to generics. Generic utilization went from 40% to 80%. Why do you think it's coming so much cheaper than it's supposed to be? Because we created economic incentives for non-poor people to do sane things. So Democrats come in and say, oh, my God, we've got an election in two years. Let's close the donut hole. There are no poor people in the donut hole. There are no poor people that pay a penny for a Medicare drug benefit. So the bottom line is somebody's paying for all this stuff. So you were all in the position of, spending two, of collecting $2.4 trillion this year of revenues and spending 3.6. Merry Christmas. It's your country. It's your problem. The numbers don't work. And having a president to take what we got economically right now and create 37 new million people on entitlement on January 1, 2014, and to think you're being responsible, you're kidding yourselves. I have no fundamental problem with President Obama was trying to do, but it was absolutely, completely, fiscally reckless. And if you're going to do it, and it's what's going to happen next year, and Sheila and I have discussed this, President Obama's probably going to get reelected. if you look at the latest polls, is my guess. He's going to come the next year, and he's going to have to wake up, and he's going to have to cut a deal with it, probably Republican House. And guess what? The numbers don't work. The, the Republicans are probably going to have to raise taxes a little. It's not going to be a lot. And, and what's going to happen with the ACA? The president's health care plan is going to have to be delayed and phased in over a number of years. It should have been to begin with because the numbers don't work. You can't add $200 billion a year into the economy you got right now with the deficit you have. It's just crazy. So my problem with the ACA is I love all – I have seven docs in my family. I love them. You know, by the way, the woman who's 79 years old stacking cans, if she was poor, she wasn't paying any co-payments or deductibles on her, on her Medicare. I can promise you that. So everybody wants somebody else to pay for this stuff. You know what? Poor people should be subsidized. That's what the government's there to do, take care of poor people. Having middle-class people and upper-middle-class people pay taxes to run it through the Medicare – and Social Security and government mill to pay themselves back at 75, 80 cents a dollar is stupid. So this is all about managing our system and paying for economics. Everybody would love to have universal coverage, but at some point, the issue is about collecting all the revenues from you guys and spending it irrationally, and we're in a system where everybody wants somebody else to pay for this stuff. It just doesn't work. So you guys are stuck with it. I'll be dead, but good luck. <laughs> well, on that positive note... <laughs> We are, I'd like you um, to line up to the microphones. Those of you who have questions, we have mics on both sides and, and mics up above. Uh, don't be shy, they're not. Uh, and while you're lining up, I'd like to uh, open with a couple of questions. And the first I'd like to ask um, both of our candidate representatives what it is you would like your candidate to say on Wednesday night. What is important? in their communications during the course of the debate on Wednesday night around this issue. Yeah, well, I'll go first. I, I hope Governor Romney, who I like, I'm sure President Obama is a lovely guy too, uh, doesn't get into this all $760 billion of who took money from where. Uh, the real issue here to me is fiscal responsibility. And I would hope what he would say is, look, you know, however you feel about universal coverage, you can't go out and have a, the biggest entitlement expansion in the history of mankind. By the way, in one year, January 1st, 2014, you had, depending on whose number you believe, 32 to 37 million people in one year. Every other time, no matter how the most liberal person was, Henry Waxman, whoever, expanded the entitlement program, they phased it in. To see what happened. This is in one year, massive, massive entitlement expansion. Uh, and I would just say, look, President Obama, I, I think what you ought to do, no matter what, is say, whether you believe in the ACA or not, we should say we're not doing any of this until the federal deficit's below 2% of GDP or 3% of GDP. We need to be fiscally responsi responsible. Nobody's made a tough call in this country on anything in 10 years, in either party. So let's get our house in order before we decide to add giant, massive new programs. As, as morally correct as they may be, whether we agree on it or not, let's get our house in order before we do it. That's what I would hope you would say. So what I would ask was to suggest the president say, um, and to be clear, I have no influence over what he says. <laughs> Um, but what I would uh, encourage him to say w would be a couple of things. One is I would encourage him to, to share uh, with, with the American people a little bit about what the law has done. A lot of people still don't know uh, what the law is about, uh, what its implications are for them. Uh, but the second thing is I think that what the president knows and what he's actually said in public statements in the past is that he recognizes that there may be parts of the law which need to be improved as time goes on. Um, and just to give you a couple of examples, uh, you know, when the 1099 provisions were, mm -hmm. uh, were actually repealed out of the, the ACA uh, way back in the early days, that was something that the president ultimately came on board with. Um, he's also publicly endorsed uh, a bill which is, uh, you know, stuck in committee, unfortunately, now, to give states actually greater flexibility uh, in implementing parts of the ACA 
uh, if they can just demonstrate that they're going to achieve the same coverage benefits that the ACA provisions are already giving. So he has demonstrated a willingness to actually work on amending and improving parts of the ACA. And I would encourage him to actually put a call out to the other side as well uh, to uh, come together with him and actually work on that post-election. But the last thing I would encourage him to do is actually draw attention to one important principle, which I don't think gets very much attention, which is that in the debate over trying to provide better care to people and save money, uh, sometimes it feels like it's a black and white debate, that we have to essentially choose one or the other. But as, uh, as Don Berwick, who used to be CMS administrator, often talks about, there is a third way uh, there, which is that you can actually provide better care at lower cost. And it's not a pipe dream, it's not a fairy tale, but it's actually happening uh, in many healthcare systems across the country. Uh, the NUCA system, for example, in Alaska, you know, through their efforts to actually provide more team-centered care, have been able to reduce their readmissions by 50% and save on cost uh, over time while providing better quality care. Um, you know, there was just a study out actually in one of the medical journals in Annals recently um, about a project actually that's been going on in our state here in Massachusetts through Blue Cross Blue Shield. Uh, the al alternative quality contracts, where they have focused on essentially partnering with, uh, with health care providers uh, in, in, to give them essentially uh, a good set of money to take care of patients, but to share the savings uh, that come, you know, of actually taking more efficient care of people while incenting people to take care, uh, to provide, to hit certain quality benchmarks. And what they've shown is that not only has quality uh, gone up in those populations that have been taken care of here in Massachusetts, but the cost in the first year went down 1.9%. It went down 3.3% in the second year, and it's projected to go down even further in the years ahead. So this is an important principle to emphasize because it is a third way. It's an important way to focus on. And we have to, un to understand that believing that we can do better for patients with less cost is actually a reality, and that's what we should be pushing for um, as we implement the Affordable Care Act. So going into the question, you want to look at that, the number one thing you do, which I'm sure we have, do we have any single-payer advocates here? Probably have some, I guess. You know, you really want to get in a debate about where Democrats are running around health care. The fundamental problem with health care systems is Medicare and Medicaid. So if you look at, take Mass General, what percentage of your revenues come from Medicare and Medicaid? Probably 52 to 55 percent. Why is the system of health care completely screwed up? Because the government fixes prices. If you're Mass General, 55 percent of your revenues comes from the government. Every doctor gets paid the same thing. Every hospital gets paid the same thing. The government fixes prices for Medicare and Medicaid, and so you, and almost every insurance company, by the way, pays a percentage of what's called RVRVS for docs or DRGs for hospitals. So you have de facto price fixing in healthcare. Where in the history of mankind, in any society ever, price fixing worked? It never has anywhere, period. We used to build public housing. We have it because it didn't work to have the government build housing. The government doesn't run through the safe ways and put prices on groceries because price fixing doesn't work. The only place where the government fixes prices in our economy is healthcare through Medicare and Medicaid and de facto through private insurance, and it's a behavioral disaster. We have uh, volume explosions, which we've had for the 35 years I've been doing this. So when you get into this and say, what should you really be doing? You should be getting the government out of health care and trying to have the private sector at least some sense of competition over price and quality. Instead, what we do in Washington, and I helped invent some of this. I helped pass along with Sheila RVRVS in 1989, which was physician pain reform. Probably neither one of us are very proud of it now. Uh, is that fundamentally, for the government to be in there, saying the whole system paying docs is based on the relative value. You know how that works? The government sits around and takes every physician value there is for every physician service in the world, 6,700, and puts a relative value on that. How would you like them to put the relative value on what you guys are doing every day? Somebody in Baltimore, mild staff, putting a relative value on what the value of your service is. That hasn't happened in Russia in the last 30 years. So you wonder why the healthcare care system screwed up? It's all driven by stupid policy. And I hate to say it on that particular stupid policy, it's one Democrats are totally attached to, price fixing. And when I go debate friends of mine on the Democratic side, and I have many, by the way, they don't say, that's not price fixing, that's administered pricing. You heard that? Administered pricing. What the hell is administered pricing? <laughs> the only place in our society where we fix prices and we wonder why the system screwed up. One of the great challenges when we um, debate these issues and will be one of the great challenges that the two candidates have on Wednesday uh, and my old boss would say, if you can't explain it on a bumper sticker, you've lost your debate. And I think one of the questions for Bob is both of these are very thoughtful responses to the question of what it is that you would like you them to say. A smarter audience than the bumper sticker. But <laughs> the audience on Wednesday is not going to give essentially the kind of attention or time to the complicated answer to a complicated question. And I think one of the things we want to come back to, I want to get to your questions to Bob, uh, 
it a bit is what, are, what is the language that people need to use, what are the concepts that people need to talk about, and how, in fact, do you get the public engaged in this debate in a, in a meaningful way? As both of our speakers have commented, the lack of clarity, the lack of understanding about these issues has complicated this issue extraordinarily. But let me now turn to some of our questions, and then we'll come back to that. Let me begin on the left. Uh, hello. I'm, ask <laughs> sure. I'm asking this question on behalf of the JFK Junior Forum Committee. So if Romney were to be elected in November, and assuming he had a 60-vote majority, how feasible or likely would it be for him to repeal Obamacare? And on top of that, how would his replacement plan fit into the budget's deficit? Tom, you want to yeah, Well, he, would need, he probably would need 60 votes. He only need 50, 51, um, <laughs> which I don't think is particularly feasible, even if he does win. To be honest with you, I'd be surprised if the Republicans took over the Senate, even if President Romney won. So I, I personally don't think the whole thing will be repealed. I do think no matter who gets elected president, it's going to be delayed and slowed down and phased in. I think if President Obama gets reelected, I believe in the, middle of, in, in the midst of a budget deal, it will be delayed and phased in over a couple of years rather than starting next year. I think if President Obama, if, Pre if Governor Romney gets elected, my guess is it will be delayed six, seven, eight years, maybe delayed forever. I, I don't think they'll have the votes to repeal it because, for example, to get to 51, you have to have Scott Brown, and my guess is he probably wouldn't vote for, to repeal it. I think you have to ask him. Uh, so I don't think it would be totally repealed. I think it would be revisited and slowed down and, down and downsized. And what would I do? I think Republicans are going to basically say, we're not doing it for a while. And I personally would say we shouldn't do it until we have the deficit below. I wrote an editorial before this thing passed in the Washington Post two years ago. We shouldn't do it until the deficit is below 3% of GDP. You can't have your candy until you make some tough calls. So uh, I have long been a fan of universal coverage. I, would be, I think you should use universal coverage to a catastrophic health benefit. So when you go to the emergency room, Brigham and Women's is not eating a $100,000 bill. But I don't think we need to provide everybody in the country with a Blue Cross, you know, standard option, $300 deductible plan subsidized by other taxpayers up to 400% of poverty. It's just absolute foolishness. So what I hope Republicans would do once they cleaned up our fiscal disaster and came back at this in a couple of years is say, everybody in the country should have coverage. They should have coverage to a basic catastrophic health plan unless you're poor. And if you're poor, you get a lot more because you're on Medicaid. And we now have already have 62 million people in America on Medicaid. What's your social policy judging about who should get completely free health care? My own view is it's pretty stupid to have people at 400% of poverty, 62% of Americans, having the rest of us pay taxes to subsidize each other. I mean, it sounds great, but somebody's paying for it someplace. The, the, um, the issue between 60 and 51 that Tom points out is a function of the budget rules in the Senate. And the presumption is that if you used a reconciliation process around the budget process, that it only requires 51 votes, but there are only certain elements of the legislation that will be subject to that. They have to have a revenue or a budget impact in order to be eligible to be in a budget bill. But that would be the difference between a 60 full repeal of everything uh, versus a 51 vote in the Senate. Repealing the insurance rules, which some of whom I agree with, some of the, sub some of the things that were in the ACA. I mean, look, the warm fuzzy stuff in the ACA, a lot of it I agree with. The issues, it's not the money, it's the money. It's hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars. The spending can be slowed by 51 votes. Right. The actual regulatory stuff needs Cannot. 60 votes. But what concerns me is the spending. I actually, some of this wonderful stuff by pre existing conditions, I mean, I, don't, I think most Republicans probably support that. Right. Let, to the right. Hi. <laughs> My name is Drew Kular. Thank you very much for being here. Um, this has been very informative. I, I had a quick question. Um, for Mr. Scully, you mentioned several, uh, several things that were wrong with the current plan and how it's fiscally irresponsible. Uh, and you also mentioned that universal health coverage is something that we can all agree on. Um, but it seems to me that promise kind of rings hollow if there's not a vision uh, about how to get that. I mean, people are sick now, and presumably they, they need care at this time. Is there anything in, in the Republican plan that, that you would do in the near future? Um, is there any replacement vision other, other than just repealing Obamacare, is there anything that you would do specifically in order to ensure that more people have health care at this time? Yeah, I, I don't call it Obamacare generally because I think it's kind of derogatory. But the uh, no, I, th I, I would repeal it just because I think you need to start over. I would hope we wouldn't. You know, I don't think we should do any of this until we basically find a way to get somewhere within spitting distance of a balanced budget. At least, I mean, it's just crazy to this kind of entitlements. I, morally, do I think it's the right thing? Yes. There are a bunch of things that I would do, which Governor Romney might not say. Most Republicans, and to be honest with you, a lot of Democrats have been what's for a tax cap for years. To just go out and say, everyone in this country is entitled to a basic Chevrolet health plan. And if you want to get a Blue Cross Blue Shield 
$1,000 deductible, great. That's going to be tax deductible to you as an individual and, and your employer, and you'll be tax preference for that. Anything more than that, you're going to be taxed on as income. Raises a ton of dollars, and you should take that and spend it on uninsured people. Who's against that? Unions, because they love first dollar coverage. Some employers are. My partnership in New York, I think my actual family coverage, because it's first dollar, why not? Why, why shouldn't my firm cover everything I pay for? My kids' braces, my dental coverage, I think it's 22000 bucks a year when it was last year on average. I don't pay for anything. Why? Because it's tax privileged. It makes absolutely no sense. You should put a limit on deductibility for a basic health plan. Everybody above that, including all the union members, should pay tax on it. That raises a ton of money to spend on the uninsured. But you have to make those tough calls. The biggest problem I have with the ACA is it doesn't make a tough call on anybody. It just says, let's take imaginary money, borrow from the Chinese, and spend more. That's the fundamental problem with it. There are tough calls to be made in Medicare, in Medicaid, in tax policy. I'm not arguing that Governor Romney's made all of them, but I think he'll, there's a better chance he'll do it next year than President Obama because he punted on those. The tax policy I'm talking about, by the way, Senator Baucus, chairman of the Finance Committee, all through the Obamacare, Obama plan debate, excuse me, uh, was, talked about Cadillac taxes and saying, look, at above a certain level, we're going to tax these plans. Absolutely, totally the right thing to do. Most conservative Democrats thought that. Almost every Republican under thought that. They caved at the end and threw it out. Why? Because the unions didn't want it. It was a ton of revenue. It was the right thing to do. It was a tough call, and they didn't, didn't make it. So there are plenty of options out there. Yeah. Hi, my name is Alice Coombs. I'm a past president of the Mass Medical Society and a practicing physician for 30 years. Uh, one thing I want to say, and it cannot be overstated, that our system is not the best system. Let's just let's get that ground rules. Please accept that. There's too many studies that have actually showed in terms of infant mortality, longevity. It's it, it, countless studies. Uh, point number two, the cost is escalating, and we understand that something needs to be done. But we also understand that a lot of it has to do with coordination of care. And a lot of it has to do with unnecessary ED visits and rehospitalization. For instance, Massachusetts, we're coming close to a billion dollars with that, just those two things by itself. How do we save? Well, everyone knows that we're talking about integrated health care delivery systems, systems that actually talk to each other, systems in which a patient is taken care of in a very, very comprehensive fashion. But that's one piece that's in the ACA. The other piece that's in the ACA is the notion of workforce, whether it's nurses, or doctors. Um, I don't see an option on the Republican side that actually addresses these very two concerns. We have a physician population of 55 and older that's about 40%. When the stock market does well, guess what? I think many of them will retire. So you have an infusion of new Medicaid patients into the system with the ACA, but more importantly, you have your Medicare patients. How will we address this new group of populations of patients that are going to be distributed across fewer physicians? Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd like to know, um, if not ACA, what is your idea of something that can address the concerns of coordinated care as well as workforce improvement? You're picking on me. You want to... All right, so since I don't live here, I'll, I'll get that after you. you know, don't worry. So what would I do? Because this will be really popular here. Uh, one of the things you get to do as a CMS minister is you get to visit every town in America, whether you like it or not, with a congressman, Democrat, or Republican. And almost every one of them has a, whether you know, how, how the unemployment rate is and how many, how many buildings in the shopping center are shuttered, they have a brand new hospital with a new wing built by Medicare money. And the one thing I always notice when I come to Boston or Nashville or Louisville is that the whole town is hospitals and healthcare built for Medicare money. And people are wondering, how come the system is so inefficient? So I love Boston, but your entire, health, entire town is a federally funded healthcare center. So when you look at that, I think we should spend more money on doctors and nurses and probably to some degree subsidize. We have a shortage of both doctors and nurses. But we spend a ridiculous amount of money in the wrong places on lots of construction facilities we don't need. All of this paid for by federal dollars. So you want to talk about making rational behavioral incentives. The money's got to come from someplace. We're collecting, you know, two-thirds of what we spend. And I, I'm all for spending more money on educating docs and nurses because we're going to have a massive shortage. But at some point, you've got to make a tough call. And every hospital in this country that I know, it's hard for me. I'm a, I was in the hospital business for years. I ran an hospital association. My firm owns two large hospital chains. Find me a hospital in the country that didn't have a crane in front of it. Find me a part of Boston that's not being rebuilt with a new medical center. I mean, this money doesn't grow on trees. You have to make tough calls. So I agree with you. We have a huge shortage of clinicians. We don't have a shortage. We have a huge shortage of people making tough calls about health care policy. 
to fund all this new capital development that's paid for with federal dollars. So I would move some of it around. I would add one, um, one other factor. I think, um, I think it is true of both Republicans and Democrats that there is a growing appreciation for the workforce issues which have not been paid attention to for a lot of years. I think there is a fundamental question about what the role of Medicare ought to be. Historically, Medicare has not financed the preparation of nurses as they have medicine. And the question as to whether that is an appropriate role for Medicare is one that Democrats and Republicans, MedPAC and others have raised, what that balance ought to be, whether we ought to rethink. There are provisions in the AC that look at new methods of training. Uh, as someone who is trained and practiced as a nurse, um, I'm particularly drawn to those that look at how one looks at teams and how one trains people to practice in teams rather than in silos. So I think that is something that goes across the board. But I'll tell you, one of the greatest burdens and difficulties is at the state level, that the practice acts and the scope of practice rules that are essentially governed by state legislatures uh, have inhibited that kind of development in those kinds of teams. And I think that is one of the things that uh, I think both sides would look at. So I think that is less controversial than some of the other elements. Yes. Yeah, this is also for um, Mr. Scully. Um, sorry to pick on you. <laughs> okay, do I have um, a single question for anyone other than Tom? He's nice. That's in the cool. line. Just, just okay, Ryan, then we'll come back to you. Okay. We'll give Ryan a shot. Hi, I'm, I'm Ryan Anderson. I'm a medical student as well as an MPP2 policy student here at Kennedy School. Um, my question for Dr. Murthy is, uh, so I am a huge fan of the pilot projects in Medicare today, and I agree that in, in concept we can get better quality at lower cost, but I do have a concern that there's not a lot of evidence of their success, and what evidence of success there is exists in places like Boston, which are the most coordinated healthcare systems, a lot of capacity here, and I'll cite two examples. One, um, kind of the precursor to the accountable care organization was the Medicare physician practice demonstration. Um, which uh, occurred under George W. Bush, um, and it showed that only very few of the hospitals that participated or the systems that participated saw any savings uh, in costs, although they did see improvements in quality. Um, the other example would just be the current ACO uh, program, the Shared Savings Program in Medicare, uh, has had real trouble getting people to enroll. Hospital systems in the, the nation that don't have the level of capacity of hospitals in, in Boston don't want to participate. So uh -huh. I guess my question is what is the real potential of these systems for places that don't have the capacity of mm -hmm. a mass general? Um, and is, is there any chance for success in, say, a rural health care system, mm -hmm. um, which really doesn't have the same kind of integrative ability over large, you know, I think, I forget, but uh, Montana has like one hospital system for two-thirds of the land mass or something. How can a system that dispersed integrate care? Mm -hmm. so, so great question. And I, I think what you point to, which is, I think, a, an important reality, is that these demonstration projects, I think, are very important. I think they can have great benefits. But it's not a given that they're necessarily going to generate the, the best results. But we're going to have to continue to look at the results, tweak the programs, look at the results, tweak the programs. In many ways, the same way that you would run a research study, you know, if you were essentially testing out a new medication. So, I, but I, what I do think, though, is that there is possibilities that these things can be successful outside a system like Boston. Uh, you know, just the other day, I was actually down in Tampa uh, for the, the bus tour that I mentioned, and was talking to a, a radiologist there who was actually involved with two separate efforts to build ACOs in the Tampa Orlando area. Uh, one has actually already gotten up and running, uh, and the other, he's actually himself trying to pull together and is finding that, you know, while there's hesitation, you know, from physicians who have been used to a certain way of doing things, there's also a growing realization that of uh, two things. One, not only do, do we need to come together, you know, as practitioners and participate in these new systems, but very important second point is that we have to actually ourselves innovate and find ways to make them work, but that we're not relying on the government to put up something and then just assume it's going to be a success. And that second part, the, the part of innovation that comes from people who are on the ground, I actually think that that is going to be a big key to the success of these demonstration projects. Now, you might ask, well, why do we need these demonstration projects? Like, why don't they just sort of crop up on their own and, you know, based on people's own entrepreneurial spirit? And the reasons for that are probably complex. And in some areas, you have had actually examples where people have built their own systems out and have, have done a great job with it. But what the demonstration projects are doing is they're really accelerating and pushing that trend forward. And that's what's very important. And then and it's important to think of this not only just as a, something the government is doing, but this wave of innovation that's actually coming through the ACA is actually prompting changes in the private sector as well. 
Uh, and you have private insurance companies, which both before the ACA and increasingly now after the ACA uh, are building out programs you know, that are trying to figure out alternative ways to deliver care and to do what we talked about before, that third way of providing better care but at lower cost. Uh, so I think that I'm optimistic. I actually think that it's possible based on not uh, hope uh, alone, but based on the fact that it has actually happened in other parts of the country. Uh, but I don't think it's going to be easy. It's not going to happen just because we put them in place right away. Uh, this morning, actually, I was talking to some of the folks at Partners who are involved in building out our ACO. And what they told me was very interesting. They said, you know, while Partners, you might think, oh, it's a very coordinated system. They build all kinds of, you know, great tools. You know, they have, you know, a lot of market power, blah, 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 blah. The thing about Partners is that they were, their slope of, of change, you could say, in terms of building out the kind of technology they need to really be integrated, in terms of building out the patient center medical homes that they really need to do, the rate of growth is probably like this. And after they signed on to become an ACO, what this uh, person was telling me who helps run the ACO portion was that their rate of innovation just skyrocketed because they realized that they needed to get going quickly. Um, they actually, on the IT front, expanded their, their systems much more quickly than they had originally planned. They accelerated their patient-centered medical home uh, portions you know, of, of the practice. And so this is what you're going to start seeing in different, uh, you know, in different ACOs. I think you're seeing it already. But I think it's going to take some ongoing work and looking at the results and building on those. We'll come back to Tom in just a second to respond to that. I, I do want to um, acknowledge the comment about rural areas, and I think this has been one of the great conundrums. Um, you have Mayos, you have Rochester, you have Intermountain. Uh, but as a general matter, the conundrum in those areas where there are very few resources and the ability to coordinate is one of the great challenges. And, I, and one of the other challenges, frankly, historically in Medicare is that we do demonstrations that never seem to end and never seem to come to conclusion. Uh, I was involved in the uh, development of the PACE program, which is a program for seniors that began out of San Francisco at the Onlock Senior Program. And it was years before we could ever get enough information in a coordinated way that allowed us to defend and argue the case for, in fact, incorporating that into the statute. So the, the department does not have a good history of organizing, managing, testing, and resolving questions that are raised in those uh, demonstrations. And I think that will be one of the challenges, both in the design of the demonstrations as well as whether we can use the information. But rural areas continue to be an enormous problem. Uh, there's no question about it. Tom, I'll get back to you in a minute, but let me turn to this kind gentleman who allowed me to shift to the left for a moment. Michael, let me make my ACO. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just had a quick question. You keep on saying that it's a financial boondoggle and that it's going to be really bad for the deficit, but the CBO's estimate over a 10-year window actually shows that it decreased the deficit. So I was just wondering if you could explain the yeah, discrepancy between what the CBO is saying and what you're saying. Well, the CBO... Briefly. Sheila said briefly. She is really roughing me up. I don't know if you guys are roughing me up more Sheila's Sheila is roughing me up more. So basically the ACA said, you should figure this out in government because it's very clever if you're going. The ACA basically said that what CBO said is if you start the spending in year four in a 10-year window, which is what they did, right? So they spent $1.1 trillion, $1 trillion over 10 years starting in year four. And the cuts that they made in Medicare and the tax increases, they started in year one. So in the 10-year window that was scored... They raised or cut Medicare at roughly $600 billion, and they raised $600 billion in taxes to simplify it. So they, they basically raised new revenue for the government by either raising taxes and fees and cutting Medicare spending by $1.2 trillion, and they spent $1.1 trillion, all of which was backloaded in the last six years. So that was the math, and they said over the first 10 years of which this is scored, which are the rules, we actually lowered the deficit by $100 billion. Absolutely true, except for the fact when you have a massive deficit, all those tax increases you would have otherwise done – and Medicare cuts for any normal person in a normal year would have gone to reduce the deficit that's already, you know, 10% of GDP. So what they said was, yes, we just did this math to do entitlement program. We took all the stuff we normally would have done in 1997 under Bill Clinton or 1990 under George Bush when I was the entitlement cutter. And instead of using it for deficit reduction, we created this giant new entitlement program. So technically over 10 years, did they pay for it? Yes. The reality is the spending goes on forever. The savings are short term. And on a technical basis, it was paid for but it ignores the fact that you got a 10% of GDP deficit. So technically you're correct, but for anybody that really actually does this stuff, it's kind of a joke. And can I just ask, then why is it that if you repealed it, the deficit would go up after 10 years? Because, because you're assuming you're going to re repeal all the cuts that were then in Medicare and all the tax increases and say we're going to get rid of those too. And we'll all do in a political year. Right. I think Governor Romney said they might do that. Realistically, 
nobody's going to repeal the, I mean, but those taxes, repeal that. in a normal deficit environment, you would have done those Medicare cuts and those tax increases, which both Bill Clinton and George Bush one did, and say, great, let's do this, reduce the deficit. And then once we reduce the deficit and get the country back under some sense of rational management, then we'll talk about new programs. Let me, um, let me interject before I turn to the gentleman on my left um, and just ask Bob to comment as well in the context of this discussion around health care as one of the principal issues. What do we think is, in fact, happening with respect to the polls and with respect to the election so, uh, itself? Let me answer a question none of you would ask. Uh, that is, how is this actually going to play out in the election? What if I was the president and Governor Romney, I would say? Uh, first is, I showed you a slide, and when public opinion doesn't change in two and a half years, it's unlikely to change in anything the president's going to say in eight minutes. I know you all have messianic beliefs and debates, uh, but in general, uh, you don't move a number that doesn't change for two and a half years in eight minutes. Then what if I would do? There was another slide. Damn it, this guy Ryan put slashing, changing Medicare on him. Hmm, interesting thing. Who really cares about changing Medicare and scared to death exactly the people who are going to vote for Governor Romney before he put it on the table? So if, if I uh, was President Obama, I would say, great Affordable Care Act, I'm going to call you after the election, and I would use my eight minutes to talk about my vision for Medicare doesn't have to go down that path. Now, if I was Governor uh, Romney, I would do exactly uh, what Tom just said. The top issue is the economy. Stop talking about the $716 billion. Tie the economy, which is the only thing that a lot of older voters might actually vote for you on, uh, to what this issue is all about, which is postpone, move it down the line, l let's do that. Uh, so uh, the dilemma is voters are not the same as policy people, and what they're going to worry about is different. But my one teachable moment is since everybody here is a public health educator at heart. If they haven't changed their mind in two and a half years, the next brochure won't matter. So uh, basically, this bill is either going to follow a sweep of one party or the other. But we're not going to convince those who don't like it uh, to move there. That's long past. They should have won it in the first 90 days. They didn't, and it's up to the election to decide uh, where this is going to go. Gentleman on my left. Thank you. Um, I'm a physician and uh, also um, a Kennedy School graduate. Um, I work in Latin America with uh, the chaotic healthcare system. I work in Europe with the uh, so-called so socialized medicine, and I work in this country for almost 20 years. So I have witness the difference and similarity of the different system. The system here is, as you uh, mentioned, the more you, the more you do, the more you make. And in the socialistic system, the more you do, the more you spend. And I have seen the impact of technology in the cost of the health care and the impact of overuse of technology and, and resources. But um, it looked to me that during the, um, the last four years of the Obama administration, the Republican rhetoric has been an excellent example of that the memory is perishable. Because um, you show an excellent analytic skill, and you, um, but that's those analytic skills that are for sure available in many of the members of the Republican Party was not used during the trillion of dollars that were down the toilet in Afghanistan and in, in Iraq. So my question is, why not using, I mean, and I never heard the word mess from the Republican during the Iraq and Afghanistan war. So why not using that analytic skill that you have just shown in working together 
with the other party because there is no question that the health care need an overhaul. So we all agree that that is needed. What not working together and not why not using that analytical skill to uh, the, use the collaboration rationality rather than to say no, 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 and oppose and, and, and get into the standing still that we are at the moment. I'll, I'll take that on if I may. Um, I think, in fact, notwithstanding what appear to be the sort of deep divisions that Bob has pointed out, which are, in fact, quite real, I think there are members on both sides of the aisle in both the upper and lower body, the House and the Senate, um, who are in fact having those conversations. Uh, as has generally been the case historically in the Senate, uh, there is more ability to build consensus. There tend to be more people that are prepared to come to the middle. Now we've seen in recent elections a decline in the middle, and I think Bob can confirm that, that we've seen more the extremes. The extremes have voted, and we've seen candidates that have tended to be at the extreme on both sides. But I think at the end of the day, you still have a gang of folks, Mark Warner is among them, um, Corker is among them, on both sides of the aisle. So once the election is over, I am convinced that they, in fact, will do as you suggest which is calmer heads from both sides will have a conversation about how to go forward, both with respect to the deficit as well as with respect to the elements of the ACA that people agree ought to be changed. I mean, many of the elements of the ACA, I will tell you, were part of a bill that Bob Dole supported for years. Most of the insurance reforms, he even talked about an individual mandate. Dominici supported it. Danforth supported it. There were others, uh, Dave Durenberger. Um, so I think it, when things calm down, I think getting past this election will improve the opportunities for the kind of conversation you suggest, which have really not been possible in the last year and a half to two years. Um, so I think the elements are there, the possibility is there, the members are there that will allow this to occur if the opportunity presents itself. And I think there are conversations that are already begun Max Baucus is among those on the Democratic side, certainly Chuck Grassley, Orrin Hatch, and others on the Republican side. But I think getting through this cycle will certainly improve the opportunity for those conversations to occur. But that is not to underestimate the strong views held nor the, the very divided points of view that we see reflected in the electorate uh, and among some of the members. But I think there is an opportunity there to move Thank forward. You. Yes. So I had a question about the costs. So I feel like, yes, there are a lot of ways that the ACA can increase costs, but there are some that it can decrease costs. Um, three examples off the top of my head are, you know, if you have a patient who is in the donut hole for Part D, I mean, isn't it possible that then they aren't getting the medication they need, and so then they'll, go, they'll cut on something, usually having to do with chronic conditions, because they probably feel like they're okay and then they'll end up going to the hospital instead or the ER. Um, on, a, on a similar note, if you have someone without insurance who, again, maybe has a chronic condition that could be getting like monthly care through a physician, that instead of getting that, um, they wait until it gets really bad and then they go to the ER as well. So, I mean, mm -hmm. the cost of virtual there, I would think, would be a lot more expensive to go to the ER. Um, and also the ER is subsidized by the government as well, so there are costs being spent there. So um, your question? So I just, I would like it to be addressed, like in terms of those are things that can be saved on, mm -hmm. and I didn't hear those talked about at all. Well, I think well, there well, are. I think we talked about them. I, I, think there, I think we have, and I think there are a number of uh, attempts to look at readmissions, uh, real incentives to focus on the readmission issues and essentially penalize hospitals where readmissions where are essentially uh, problematic. Certainly the advent of the increase in preventive services, the question about the use of emergency rooms for primary care, the movement away from that towards uh, coordinated care, managed care, um, sort of um, practices that manage patients differently. I think there are incentives in the bill that do that and I think there has been interest on both sides of the aisle in getting at those issues in the Medicare program, and certainly to the extent in the Medicaid program as well, where you've seen an increase in the use of um, management 
of patients and particular attention to the dual eligibles, people that are eligible for Medicare and Medicaid, and essentially new efforts at trying to manage the duals, and that's been something both Democrats and Republicans have supported. I mean, so, is what it, so is the argument that the increased costs overwhelm that? I mean, is that yes, where yeah, all the... the, the I mean, you know, the in, at all. Plus, if you see 10 years down the road, maybe, you know, tomorrow, I don't have insurance, now I go in, my costs are really high. But 10 years down the road, when you start preventing these, things, you'll see costs go down. Like, it's a long-term trend. You don't look at all of it, but I'm saying you, I, I, you can argue that certainly low-income people and up to 133 percent of poverty in Medicaid, you're going to have full coverage. Medicaid is very full coverage. But in the donut hole, 14 million people have no costs, period. And you debate how far you're going above that, but the basic actual value for the taxpayer of the Medicare Part D benefit this year for a really rich person who's a multi, multi, multi-millionaire playing golf in Naples, Florida is 2,000 bucks. Okay, for a full donut hole filled person that has no deductible copay, it's more like 5,200 bucks. Mm -hmm. Okay, so do you want to subsidize a really rich person for whom we're trying to raise taxes 2,000 bucks a year? My attitude is I'm buying them a catastrophic benefit and that's fine. Closing the donut hole costs the system money because seniors who are not poor switch to generics because they're smart. The second you start saying we're going to close the donut hole, I say, well, maybe I should take, take the Lipitor for a while instead of Mevacor. But Lipitor is now off patent. It's very expensive. I mean, my favorite drug, he's, I used, I, he, Sheila knows, I didn't give a speech in, in probably eight years, certainly not four years of CMS, without beating up uh, what's a uh, Prilosec and what's the uh, generic Prilosec is what, four bucks a month for a patient? And the purple pill, Nexium, is like 95 bucks a patient. It's outrageous. There's not a single, there may be one millionth of 1% of people that need to take Nexium. Millions of poor, of poor Medicaid patients take Nexia because they have no copayments and deductibles and they read purple pill ads on TV. So you start taking away financial incentives to non-poor people and you're throwing away taxpayer dollars. So you're not saving any money. You, my view is we should subsidize poor and near-poor people pretty fully. We should not be subsidizing middle-income people to do stupid things with taxpayer money. And that's what closing the donut hole is. I will go to my deathbed thinking closing the donut hole is among the dumbest federal policies ever adopted. All right, we're going to, we have people on both sides, and we have about 10 minutes left, and I want to give each of our speakers a, an opportunity to say just a last closing remark. So we're going to do a, thick, a quick round. We're going to go there, quick, quick, quick question, quick answer. Okay. Uh, I'm Leo Stolbeck. I'm a pract I've been a practicing oncologist since 1964. And in the Boston area, except for three years when I had the opportunity to work in Canada for three years and saw how well a uh, system of uh, single-payer medicine, which they call Medicare, is uh, how well it, it could work. And my, I have a quick question for each of you. Uh, <clears throat> Vivek, I, you did an eloquent job in presenting the advantages of the ACA. And my question is, why do you think that Obama hasn't done a similar job? In other words, I feel that it hasn't been promoted to the extent that it could have been, and it hasn't been explained to the extent it could. And my question for Mr. Scully is, uh, you know, you talk about price fixing and you say there's no place in the world where price fixing has worked. There are a number of countries. First of all, we're, we're not the best healthcare system in, in the world. We're 27th or 29th, and we cost us twice as much as any other country. And yet, there are a number of countries who cover just about everyone at a much lower cost. And my question for you is, the free enterprise system that we're, that the Republicans are touting as being better, uh, I don't think can accomplish uh, this. You know, the idea that health is not a commodity uh, that you can either decide to, to buy or not buy. When you get sick, you need help. And I would like to hear from you how you propose that we have an equitable system that covers everyone uh, with, with the uh, large overheads that we presently have with the insurance companies. Okay, short answer from Obama, short answer from Romney. So, Leo, thank you for the question. I, I, I think you're right that their communication job from the administration has not been great. You know, they have admitted it themselves. I think many of us feel it. And that's actually why I think it's important for 
uh, people who are regular citizens, you know, who might be part of the administration or part of the campaign, to actually go out there and to share the truth about what they see, you know, whether they agree or disagree with the law. But unfortunately, that's not what, what's happening right now. Um, you know, like we, our whole bus tour in the South was about that. Um, but I think that, unfortunately, we see a, a caricature that's been sort of created of, of the law that's being pushed by, uh, you know, by both parties at times. A lot of times, I think it happens more with the Republican Party, who is they're trying to tear down the ACA. Um, but uh, we need to get back to what's actually happening on the ground. Uh, and I think that's what's going to be the most powerful message. So I agree with you. Yeah, I think the president's done a pretty good job, actually. And I, I wish we'd have a more very detailed substance debate about this stuff instead of just throwing rhetorical one-liners at each other. Uh, but, uh, you know, do I, I fundamentally think uh, if you look at the systems, I don't think anybody in the country, in the world is doing a great job. I don't think you've ever heard me say that we have the best health system in the world. I think our system's a mess. I said that at the beginning. Medicare, Medicaid, the whole thing's a behavioral disaster. Uh, I do think the systems that have generally considered to be doing better than anybody else are probably the Germans and the Dutch, and they probably have a much more capitalist, little community-based system of competitive kind of HMO-like health care than we do. So if you ask me what my model would be, which I've said for years, which Sheila may not agree with, I, um, I've been an unabashed fan of the Ron Wyden, who's a liberal Democrat from Oregon, uh, you know, American, uh, Healthy Americans Act, which we get rid of Medicare, get rid of Medicaid, create basically exchanges for everybody and subsidize you based on your age and your income, and not have all these bizarre different behavioral systems chasing us around. Ron Wyden's one of those liberal Democrats in the Senate. I happen to think he has the best plan out there. It's probably politically untenable. But if you want to look, make, that's the one that looks most like the Dutch system, much like the German system. Everybody's got a different system. But, you know, my view is there's no place in the world that said the government fix relative units for prices for hospitals and doctors that's worked, and including Canada. And it just doesn't work to have the government fix prices per unit in any system. And the better systems in the world haven't done that in my opinion. I'm going to give you the last question and apologize to the two remaining individuals, but you're welcome to come up at the end, and then I'm going to ask each of my speakers to comment very briefly to close this out. Last question. Hi, I'm Paul Miaski, and I have a C I have CVID. And I was um, wondering, uh, as someone with CVID and someone who knows that, that costs can accumulate quite quickly if you're born with something that is, you know, something you can't handle by yourself, um, if you put a ca like a line, you talk about a Cadillac tax or the donut hole or whatever, and you say 400% poverty rate or whatever, I come from a, I'm lucky. I come from a pretty nice background, but even then, we can't afford $3,500 a week on medication, which is what it cost me. So it's luckily I'm covered at the moment through my parents' health care. Um, but if how that changes, like how do you draw a line and determine? Like, are these, are these poor people who aren't really sick, or are they, is this somebody who is not technically poor, and how do we give them the health care they actually need? Do you want me to answer that first? I mean, I think that's what health insurance is all about. That's why I support some of the reforms are in the ACA. So if you're in, I happen to be a fan relatively of exchanges, if they're not oversubsidized for too many people. And the basic concept of insurance is to have all of us who are relatively healthy pay for someone like your family. And so if your father happens to be above 400% of poverty and he can afford insurance premiums in his group, he should probably pay the relative level of premiums. But if your family happens to consume 500000 or a million dollars health care a year versus my family that hopefully consumes a lot less, that's the whole nature of insurance. That if my kid was, had, your, had those health issues, hopefully that's why you have homeowners fire insurance and insurance is for kids for events like yours. And God bless you, but that's what insurance is for. I don't think anybody would advocate that we should take someone that has incredibly high cost. I mean, the whole goal is to get everyone into the system and it covers folks like you with all of us kicking in. That's what health insurance is designed to be. Yeah, and, and at this point I would, I would say I agree, actually. I think that's why we need health insurance, and that's why we need health insurance for everybody. We have to make sure that it's accessible to everyone. We have a dual problem of trying to make sure that we bring costs down as well. Um, and until we do that, then we're going to have a problem actually insuring everybody. Um, but in the short term, uh, and even going forward, there are so many reasons about, for us to focus on coverage, uh, not just because it impacts people's quality of life, but because it has real economic impact on people's productivity. Uh, it has impact on the costs that they generate down the line to the system. The idea of, of primarily having catastrophic coverage for people, while that is an idea that's discussed a lot, part of the challenge is that if you just have catastrophic, uh, or you focus on that primarily, you lose a lot of opportunity to take care of disease actually fairly early on when it costs less. Uh, so I do think we need to get uh, people insurance. Uh, I think it's a priority, and I think that's one of the priorities in the ACA. That's why I support it. You, would you like to begin with your two minutes to close this out, and then sure. Tom, and then Bob gets the last word. Last word. Oh, sorry. 
Um, sure. So first of all, I want to say just I really enjoyed uh, this discussion. And what, I, what I'm struck by is the fact that this discussion is not what happens out there you know, about, about health care, uh, which is that you know, I have real differences with, with Tom, perhaps, but I also have a lot of things that you know, we probably feel similarly on. And the discussion out there on health care has become a very black and white discussion. It's become about a, a bill that's a communist you know, a sort of plot uh, versus another one that's going to solve sort of like all of the country's health care problems. And there's a reality that's in between. Uh, and it's in that reality that we, uh, that reality that we actually want to focus on. And the problem I think that we face right now politically is, is that I think as, as a citizen, and I see myself closer to sort of the citizenry than I do the government, um, that there isn't a clear leadership uh, sort of from uh, the parties to really move us beyond this place where we're talking in caricatures and not talking about the real issues. Uh, because the truth is, if we, if we looked at the law and we said, look, this is a law that's helping people, let's figure out how to fix the pieces which don't seem like they're going to work in the long term and move it forward, we could actually have some real discussions about that, whether they're around how to make certain parts of the programs more solvent or how to make them accessible to more people. Uh, but the challenge we have is how do we get our elected leaders to actually do that? And I think that m my, my sense is that while there may be room to do that post-election, uh, there are always going to be things that um, I think increasingly in this environment that politicians are worried about, that they're running from, that I think steer them away from the kind of productive discussion that we need to have. So I think that the, the emphasis and the, um, the initiative needs to actually come from the public uh, to hold our politicians accountable to not taking extreme positions, to being informed ourselves so that we can demand that we have reasonable discussions that focus not on tearing things down, but on, us, on moving things forward. And we have that opportunity in this election. And that's actually what I find to be really exciting. This can be a change election, not just you know, for maybe changing a few people in Congress or changing a party, but for changing how we actually hold our politicians to be more accountable to working together and to making sure that things like health care and other problems like it are actually solved and that we take steps forward as opposed to bubbling over, uh, over sort of incremental differences. Thank you. Tom? Uh, well, I mean, I, I'm obviously a Romney guy, but the reason I'm that way primarily is because I do think we need to change and we need some type of conscience about fiscal responsibility. And, you know, I, I, if I were advising Governor Romney, I would tell all of you who are young enough not to have seen to pull out the Ross Perot tapes from 1992. You know, Ross Perot's worked because over and over and over and over again, even though he was ugly and had big ears and, and probably the most, the most uh, attractive guy, people wanted to hear substantive details about fiscal responsibility. And it may be boring, but that's what most people want. And I think that's really what the world's starved for. And at some point, we're starved for leadership. Who wouldn't want to have universal coverage? I mean, God bless me. I'd like to have in the room five cookies. Uh, it's just at some point, you've got to make tough decisions. And I hope at some point getting around to doing that. You know, I, the politics is nasty on all sides. For those of you who aren't old enough, you can go back and look at my press clips. I had 258 negative editorials in papers written about me in one month. Some of you were in 2004 because the Medicare drug benefit was the worst thing that ever happened in the history of mankind. And I was an evil SOB for pushing it through. And because I threatened to fire my actuary, which never happened, those of you who remember, and all these terrible things. Now, eight years later, magically, Part D is a good thing. But, you know, back then, Democrats opposed it because it was a Republican idea. <clears throat> the one thing we did, and the reason it survived, and I think has become somewhat less controversial, is because Senator Kennedy voted for it. From the first day, we made it bipartisan. We knew it was going to be controversial. We had Senator Kennedy and Senator Baucus, Senator Bro. We got about 10 or 15 dot Democrats. So we moved it just far enough to the mi middle that it held up. And it was a little bigger than some Republicans like, but it was at least quasi-bipartisan. The biggest mistake President Obama made in this bill, which frustrated me from the beginning, is maybe the Republicans weren't playing ball, but at some point they would have. It's impossible to pass something this big and this massive and this all-encompassing and do it on a 100% party line vote. And in the long run, it's foolish. Even if he gets reelected, it's not a good idea. At some point, you've got to make it semi-bipartisan. You've got to at least pick off a few. Well, there's only Olympia snow or whatever. This thing became you know, get in your trench and lob grenades at each other fight because it was a 100% party line vote. So every Republican was against it, and every Democrat was for it. And neither one of them have a clue outside of a few what they're talking about on either side. And you've got to get to the point where there's at least some sense of bipartisanship. And my biggest complaint about President Obama, I'm sure he's a very wonderful guy, is that he didn't, he, you got it, I don't care how hard it is, at some point, you can have him down to lunch of the White House 4,000 times. You, you have to personally make the effort to make this bipartisan because policy this big won't help hold up otherwise. And even if he gets reelected, this is going to be controversial for another 20 years. And Democrats will wish for another 20 years they hadn't passed it. Whereas if he had moved five degrees to the middle, scaled it back a little bit, throw the Republicans a few bones. He might have only gotten a few of them, but that would have been enough. And he made a huge mistake. 
Bob, the last word. Uh, when I was a student, these professors used to annoy me by telling me every election really mattered. This time, this one does. Uh, and very simple. Uh, uh, one side says that we can afford to do this with all its problems. The other side is we can't afford to do it, and we have to postpone it to another time. We have no way to settle this in this country except by an election. Uh, when it's over, then we have to deal with Tom's problem, because if you study what I study is, the biggest disease we have is not cancer. It's the huge partisan shift where people leave rooms, won't talk, won't follow through. Uh, you say a statement, I run an ad against you, I attack your character. If we cannot slow that down after this election, we cannot deal with the complex issues uh, that, that we just discussed tonight. We have to find some way to lower the temperature between people who live in different parts of the country and different values, or, or, or we can't move ahead with this. But the first call is the election's about, in this economic time, can we afford to do what was enacted or not? And on that note, uh, leave with the message, if you do nothing else, vote because it will matter. Thank my colleagues. And thank all of you, you are a great audience.